This is one of the famous 1 to 8K toast rack spectrums. It was given to a friend of mine by someone who's unfortunately passed away, so it has a lot of sentimental value. It's the victim of a bodged recap, so we're going to replace the capacitors and see if it springs back into action. Or not. Mark fixes stuff. This video is sponsored by PCBWay. You can get an instant quote on a variety of services, or browse a library of talented makers' designs, add them to your cart, and have them delivered directly to your door. This spectrum was sent to me before my house caught fire, and in the mess of my life that happened afterwards, it was subsequently forgotten. But there's quite an emotional story behind this spectrum, so I'd like to get it fixed and back to the owner as soon as possible. You can see some remnants of smoke inside the case, but no real damage. But you can also see it's been the victim of a bodged recap. Apparently the machine was working before, so we're going to take out all of the capacitors and replace them with a new set. And that new set has come from retroleum.co.uk. Usually I'd order my capacitors separately, but this time I went for a kit. So let's disconnect the keyboard, gripping the membrane tails firmly, but pulling them gently out of the Molex connectors. Now we need to take the board out, so we'll need to move this to one side. I've just noticed that the regulator isn't actually connected inside this machine, so it would never work anyway. These are the tensioners for the plastic legs on the underside of the machine. Don't lose these, although there are 3D printable replacements now. We're also going to take out the legs because otherwise they're going to rattle around and drive us nuts. Lovely. With that all disconnected, we just need to remove these screws and I've noticed something a bit weird. That is certainly not the right screw for this board. It's about 10 times too long. It's the wrong part in the wrong hole, so we need to put pay to that. I'm opening myself up to some criticism here, but I know this tool is a bit too big. In my defense, I just grabbed it in the heat of the moment. Although I'm not sure that these are the right screws for the machine, we'll keep them safely anyway. Only one more thing to do before we remove the board, and that is to take out the reset switch, which just pushes into position on the left-hand side of the case. And with that done, we're free to pull it out. Sinclair Spectrums really are a marvel of cost-based engineering, and I'm always pleased to work on them. We can put the lower case aside now. Here we go, let's have a look at the underside of the board and see what kind of damage lurks beneath. And I have to say, I'm pretty surprised. I'm not seeing too much damage at all. Great! So back to the top side, what we need to do is remove all the capacitors first. Turning back to our Retroleum kit, I just want to show you that I've bought two things here. First and most obvious is the Recap Kit. And this is really well put together. I bought this, I paid for it, and this isn't a review and they haven't sent me anything for free. It's just a nice, easy way to get a kit. The instructions actually list the capacitors at the top in a really handy format and also show the capacitor locations. And the second thing I bought was this gel bar reduction kit. Sometimes when you display a ZX Spectrum on a modern TV, you'll see some vertical lines and these are colloquially called jail bars. This will probably be in another part of the video because I want to see how it looks without them. Okay, let's do this. There's quite a few capacitors here. Let's get to work. Now I don't want to bore you by filming every single one of the capacitors, but I will film any that look interesting. For example, this one. And perhaps we can discuss what's gone wrong. Powering on my desoldering station.
we notice it's set to 480 degrees, which is far too hot. That would scorch the board, so we're going to knock it down to a much more reasonable 360 degrees centigrade. Moo. Removing the first lead goes pretty well. In fact, we clear the hole immediately. But on the second lead, we have a bit of a problem. It just doesn't seem to be clearing. And that's unusual because this isn't even on a ground plane. Then I realized that I had a big problem and my desoldering station had failed on me. Oh no. Old school, it is firing up my soldering iron and grabbing my engineer SS02 solder sucker. It's time to get medieval and manual on this board. The SS02 has a silicon tip so you can get right in on the joint without it burning or melting. Now the first leg is completely free. On the second leg I add some more solder. This is so the solder sucker can get hold of it counterintuitive but it's a working technique. Then heating the solder on the joint we get the solder sucker in nice and close and hit the button. That's cleared all the solder out of that hole and that was pretty successful. The joy of suction. Although there's a couple of little marks on the board I'd rather weren't there. Wiggling our part it soon slips out and here they are. Now this one is particularly interesting. It looks like what's happened is this lead goes to a ground plane and they didn't have a powerful enough iron to make the connection take. Oh dear, we're going to have to remove all of this solder here to get to the hole and clear it. This green crinkly looking stuff is actually solder mask over the top of actual solder. It was a process that they used in the 1980s. That's made no difference. So I'm going to add some fresh solder so that it flows a bit more easily. I'm going to apply some flux to this and then I'm going to use some solder wick. Braided solder wick uses capillary action to wick away the solder from large joints like this. The heating of the copper means that the solder runs into the copper and away from the board. It's pure physics, but it really works in our favor here. And that's worked a treat. Solder wick really earns its place in any solderer's toolbox. This other lead doesn't actually go the whole way through the board, so I'm having to heat it from the top of the board in order to remove it. I'm gently manipulating the leg so that it slips out of the hole when it's hot enough. I'm not pulling here, I'm just trying to angle the lead so it comes out with the least resistance. With that done, we'll try and suck away the solder that's left. And our old friend the desoldering wick comes back into play. I made a mistake here and I didn't move the desoldering wick enough so it's stuck slightly. But after some more heating, off it comes. There's a little bit of damage to this eyelet, but nothing critical. This leg isn't connected at all, it's just sat in a mess of cracked solder. The first approach is to remove the solder in the hole by heating it from the underside. Then flipping over the board, we'll gently pull out what really wasn't much of the lead. There you have it ladies and gentlemen, that's not how to do it. The real trick with desoldering wick is knowing when to move the wick so it doesn't get stuck. This is something you can only really practice, but I tend to start moving it as soon as I see the solder coming along the wick. The board's really quite a mess, so I use the iron to try and clean up any of the solder spatter that's adhered itself to the tracks. I'm doing this really quickly. You don't want to dwell on these tracks or you might lift them from the board. With the solder spatter cleared, I give the board a preliminary clean with a bit of isopropyl alcohol. And then I go to bed. The next day brings a surprise. Remember that my desoldering station died a death. 
Well, I looked into it, and there's some kind of unblockable clogging right in the nozzle. It's not something I can fix, so I need a new gun. This desoldering station has served me really well, so it's worth getting a new gun just to put it back into service. And I thank you for your service, Mr. Desoldering Station. However, something amazing happened. This arrived via Amazon Prime, and one of my wonderful patrons has actually donated this to the channel. It arrived in what I can only describe as the swankiest bag this side of the 1980s. And there was a note. I told Damien that my desoldering station had failed, and he very kindly arranged for this to be delivered to me, even though his cat was very unwell. Well, his cat has made a really good recovery, and thank you, Damien. This is amazing. Moo Moo. The desoldering on this board is pretty much never ending. And as you can see, we've got some interesting situations. So I'll just do a bit more desoldering on camera and then I'll leave you to your own devices. New desoldering station is in full effect. I'm not pushing down on the board here, all I'm doing is manipulating the lead so that it clears the hole a bit better. And I have to say that this desoldering station is even better than my last one, clearing the hole and allowing me to pull out my part in record time. And talking of time, I'm not going to waste yours. I'm going to desolder these parts now and come back to you. And here we are with all the parts desoldered from the board. I've tried to check for any faults or tracks that might have been broken along the way, but I've got to say you never know when you're following somebody else after a job. The capacitor map from Retroleum is really handy and not only shows the microfarad values of the capacitors, but also the location on the board and the polarity. We're going to solder in a couple of capacitors and then we'll skip to the end. Let's do these. I can see on the paperwork that they're 47 microfarad capacitors. These parts are made by Illinois Capacitor, a company that I use myself and they were recently acquired by Cornell Dubillier, so quality is pretty good on these. Assuring that the polarity is correct, we place the part into the board. I like to make sure that the values are upwards in case they ever need to be read by somebody else. Then holding the parts in place, we move the legs to stop them slipping out when we're soldering. I always like to add a bit of extra flux. Some people say this isn't needed, but I don't see a reason not to use it. Heating the lead and the pad at the same time, we apply a bit of vintage leaded solder. It's a bit awkward working around the camera, so please forgive my Mr. Shaky Shaky hands. Now some people argue that you shouldn't clip the leads off after soldering because it puts extra stress on the joint, but that is part of a military specification. And because we're not launching anything to the moon here, I think we'll be okay. It's something to bear in mind though. Heating the lead and the pad at the same time is important for the solder to flow onto both parts. Sometimes you can't quite get the iron on both. In these extreme cases, make sure you get a bit of solder onto the lead so that the heat can transfer. And you shouldn't really double dab, but I am here. Clippity doo da. Pew. And there we have it. Two capacitors nicely soldered in. Now I've done these two, and I'm going to do the rest off camera because YouTube hates it when people stop watching, so I won't waste your time. Let's do this. And here we are with some nicely soldered in capacitors, if I do say so myself. I've tried to keep the values upwards in case anybody ever needs to read them later. But will it work? The future is unclear. 
To test it, we'll need to pop it into the lower case because that's where the heatsink and the voltage regulator are. If you're doing this, please make sure that you put the plug on the right way around. These two bits of black plastic need to be up. And we're going to use this Retro Computer Shack RGB cable. Ian really puts heart and soul into his products, so go buy from him and tell him that Mark Fix's stuff sent you. This jack is to pipe audio into the TV, but I don't want to jump the gun, so I'm not going to plug this in. For power, I'm using this 9V 2A Triad branded power supply. It's got to be center negative. If you don't use a center negative power supply, you will destroy your spectrum. Popping the power on, we can see that it was a fail, but at least it powers on. It's not the result we wanted, but it is progress. We got something we can work with. Recycling the power means that we get a blue border this time. Again, that's important information and something that we can look at in the next video. Well, it looks like there's going to be a part two for you, Mr. Spectrum 128K. Without doing any diagnostics, the feeling in my bones is it could be something to do with either the processor or the ROM. It doesn't feel like a RAM issue. Maybe we should build the Byte Delight ZX Diag card, pop it into the machine and see what that tells us. What do you think? Terry and Dave are strangely silent on the issue. Thanks Terry and Dave. And thanks to all my lovely, lovely Patreon supporters. I can't believe that you put up with this nonsense. Thanks so much for keeping me going. You guys are my rock, my safe harbor, my potato chips in the parlor and my loving banana. Just look at those names on the screen. Don't you wish you could be one of them? Well, you can by going to patreon.com forward slash stuff. Every little helps, like the old lady said when she whittled in the sea. I'm loving this funky music. Oh yeah. We are so funky.